There are three main words that are commonly used in the English language to speak about the various aspects of satanic power. They are witchcraft, divination and sorcery. Divination is essentially the fortune-telling realm. It operates by revelation, by gazing into a crystal ball, by dreams, by uh, palm reading, by teacup reading, by tarot cards and many, many other ways. That all is classified under the one heading of divination. Then there is sorcery. Sorcery operates through objects or through something which produces a physical impact or result. Sorcery operates through fetishes, through charms, through amulets, through bracelets. Many times people are enslaved because some kind of a ring or other object has been given them which is satanic in its origin. Sometimes they're not aware of that. Uh, let me illustrate this by a little example. Uh, in Miami, in a hotel about two years ago, a friend of mine was ministering to people, as I have been doing this morning, uh, finding out if their legs were unequal and uh, by the power of God causing them to grow out. And there was a young man who came forward whose legs were manifestly unequal. But when the man who was ministering held them up, the, un the short leg did not grow. It would not budge. So the man ministering noticed that this young man had a bracelet on his ankle. And uh, he said, um, where did you get that bracelet from? He said, my girlfriend gave it to me. Uh, he said, uh, are there any particular associations with that bracelet? Does it mean anything special to you? And he said, no, not really. He said, um, did it mean anything special to your girlfriend? He said, I wouldn't know. He said, would it in any way represent rebellion on the part of your girlfriend? He said, it might do. So the man ministering said, would you be willing to take the bracelet off? The young man took the bracelet off and the moment he did, without further prayer, his leg grew out. See, that was a, a way that Satan was binding him with power through this object. Witchcraft essentially is the dominating satanic force. It's the force that captivates, that dominates, that controls. And it works by spells and by curses and by personal domination. And let me say right at the beginning that it is never the will of God for one person to dominate another. In any situation where one person dominates another, the force that enables that person to do so is evil. It is never the will of God for a husband to dominate his wife, or a wife to dominate her husband, or parents to dominate children, or a minister to dominate his congregation. Any time that you get domination by one person over another, the force behind it is evil. And very often it is actually witchcraft. You see, there's such a thing as the soulish, which is quite distinct from the spiritual. This is, there is no time to go into this tonight. But the spiritual is one thing, the soulish is another. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 2, The soulish man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, neither can he know them, for they are spiritually discerned. And in James chapter 3, let me just read this short passage. Verses 14 and 15, James 3 verses 14 and 15, But if ye have bitter envying, and strive in your hearts, glory not, and lie not against the truth. If you can't live in peace with your husband or your wife, don't tell everybody that you've got it all from the spiritual point of view, you know. And our church has it all, because when the neighbors hear you quarreling, they'll know better. Now then, it goes on, This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, 
devilish. Now, the literal translation is earthly, soulish, demonic. There is a down gradation. You come down to the earthly level, you go into the soulish level, and the next thing is the demonic. So the order is earthly, soulish, demonic. And when anybody in their own natural willpower and intentions decides to get somebody else to do something, the force that they're exercising is soulish. And it frequently ends up by opening to the demonic. It's most important to understand this. Much prayer is soulish. Prayer is not a way of getting God to do what we want Him to do. Any prayer that's based on that kind of motivation is soulish to start with. Prayer is not a way of getting other people to do what we want them to do. And any prayer that's based on that motivation is soulish. Frankly, there are some people who come to me and say, Brother Prince, I'm praying for you and I sometimes wish under my breath, I wish you weren't. Because there are soulish prayers that do not bring the Spirit of God in their train, but bring dark, evil, oppressive power. Earthly, soulish, demonic. And when a person, in the name of being spiritual, becomes soulish in order to assert his own will, express his own personality, get his own desires and ambitions fulfilled, get other people doing what he wants, that person, and it's usually a woman, is in danger of coming under the influence of witchcraft. And there are, let me say, two kinds of witches, and I've dealt frequently with both kinds. There are the witches who know they are witches. They intend to be witches. They cultivate Satan's power. They deal in spells and curses and things like that. I've dealt with many of them. We've had some here in these meetings. Some have been delivered. But there's another kind of witch who really in many ways is more dangerous because she doesn't know she's a witch and other people don't know she's a witch. And she's usually a good church member. A man phoned me a little while back, long distance. He was quite excited. He said, Brother Prince, are there Pentecostal witches? And I said, yes, there are. And there are charismatic witches too. Oh, he said, what's the difference? Well, I said, Pentecostal witches usually operate in Pentecostal congregations and try to control the pastor and the congregation. Charismatic witches usually operate in home prayer groups and try to control the home prayer group and usually their husband as well. So he was silent for a few moments and then he said, well, I think what we have is a charismatic witch, he said. Now this may sound shocking to some of you, but I'm speaking on the basis of experience. I have run into this more times than I can count. And I'll give you just a few examples. About two years ago, I was preaching in a camp meeting, taking the sessions on deliverance, and God opened my mind to this while I was preaching, which is what frequently happens to me. I began to see truth that I had not prepared to preach. And so I spoke about how many, many women unwillingly dominate their husbands and their families and try to get everybody doing what they think they should be doing, usually with the best of intentions and motives. And I pointed out how in those homes the husband really never takes his place of headship in the family. And though he may be successful in business and in secular enterprises, he never becomes a fully developed spiritual person because there's a pressure in the home that keeps him from developing and that pressure is witchcraft in the wife. And I pointed out how usually it will produce rebellion in the children and it will cause a home to break up. And let me say that witchcraft is number one homebreaker in the world. And it's the prevalence of witchcraft in the United States that causes one out of every two marriages to end in divorce. Broken homes are, are in direct proportion to the power of witchcraft in a nation. 
And measured by that standard, the United States has more witchcraft at work here than any other nation on the earth. And I believe it. Well, at the end of this teaching session, a woman whom I know quite well, I've actually visited and stayed in her home. She has a husband and two teenage or just above teenage children. And they're all Christians, all baptized in the Holy Spirit. But she came up to me and she said, Brother Prince, you've described me this afternoon. For the first time I saw what's really in me. I'm what you were talking about. I'm a Pentecostal witch. Will you pray for me? She said, though my, my whole family is baptized in the Holy Spirit, there's no peace in our home. The family is falling apart. Well, I began to pray with her and I was amazed at the power of the manifestation of Satan out of that woman. In fact, I had to ask two people to come and hold her down. And she put her hand up on her spine and she said, it's fastened here in my spine and it won't turn loose. Praise God, it did get loose. But that opened my eyes to the reality of this power. I'll give you another example. Some five years or so ago, an Assembly of God evangelist who is quite well known, though probably not known by name to any of you here, called upon me for help. He told me that he was in spiritual need and asked me if I would go and speak with him and counsel with him. He took me out to lunch and I sat and listened to him. And he told me about his home problems and the, his own spiritual problems. So when we had finished lunch, we went back together to his hotel room and uh, he waited for me to offer my opinion. And I said this, I said, brother, I have only one source of information and that's what you've told me. If your information is not reliable, my diagnosis is not reliable. But if what you have told me is true, then your mother is a witch. And he said, that's what my wife says. <laughs> now, the mother was a good Pentecostal believer, a member of a Pentecostal congregation, used to give utterances in tongues and interpretations and so on. Then he said, would you pray for me? And I said, yes. Put my hand on his shoulder and realized what was going to happen. I jumped across the room, grabbed the waste paper basket and got it there just in time. And for about 20 minutes he was throwing up some filthy, slimy stuff that was just coming streaming out of his body. When he, this was finished, he said, and this was his comment, isn't that remarkable? He said, we've just been out to lunch together and we ate fried chicken. But he said, in all that I've brought up, there isn't a trace of fried chicken. He said, it didn't come from my stomach. That was his observation. I phoned him next day to inquire how he was doing. And he said, I feel fine. But he said, I feel as if I've run a 12-mile race. Every bone in my body is aching. Then he said, could you advise us as to what to do about our daughter? She was, I think, 13 years old and completely out of control. Went out all night, stayed out with men, was on marijuana and so on. Well, I said, what I suggest you do is get together with your wife, fast and pray, and when you really feel you're in the victory and you've got the power of God at your disposal, get some piece of clothing or other garment that your daughter wears regularly lay hands on it and rebuke the satanic power in your daughter. Well, that was the end of that. A year later, almost to the day, he contacted me. He was back in the area, gave me a report on how he was doing. Then I said, what happened to your daughter? He said, I want to tell you the story. He said, we did what you suggested. We waited till we'd prayed and fasted. Then we got an old blue t-shirt 
which our daughter used to love very much. Without telling her, we prayed over it, laid hands on it, rebuked the enemy. Our daughter put it on and he said, to make a long story short, she's now in a very high class Episcopal girls boarding school. She's getting grade A in every subject and they rate her a perfect little lady. That was one year later. But he said, that's not the whole story. One day, my mother, the girl's grandmother, came to our house and did something she hardly ever did, offered to do some washing for my wife. And in the laundry that she washed was the blue t-shirt. And he said, you can accept it or not, but ever since my mother washed that shirt, she's been a different woman too. <laughs> now, with a few details, that's an exactly accurate record of what that man told me. See, his mother was a Pentecostal witch. And it was her influence that was ruining the entire home. I have noticed this with such persons. Very frequently such a woman will have one grandchild whom she particularly favors. And that grandchild will become the object of her witchcraft. And it's disastrous for the child. And there are many, many, many such situations in the United States. I meet man after man after man who can never become what God requires him to be in two areas, in his home and in the work of the Lord. He can be successful as the president of a bank, he can be an athlete, he can go to Vietnam and get decorated with medals. But there's two areas in which for some reason that he doesn't understand, he's inhibited, repressed and unable to develop. And I've met men in their 50s and 60s, extremely successful in the business world, who never really matured spiritually or emotionally because they were still tied to a mother's apron strings. My personal conviction is that this is the greatest single problem that threatens the United States. And I also believe that the resolution of this problem will produce the greatest revolution this nation has ever known. Basically, and I hope you'll go on loving me, the United States is a woman-dominated nation. I have never, I've traveled widely and lived in many nations, I have never met any other nation in which was in any degree like that dominated by women. They say 80% of the capital of the nation is in the hands of women. This is partly through the laws of inheritance and so on. And this is not an attack on women. But for every 10 active women workers in the church, you're lucky to find one man. Is that right? The church and the home, the two areas of spiritual responsibility, in most cases are woman dominated. Now I don't say that in every case such a woman is a witch, but I do say that it's the power of witchcraft over this nation which is holding men down spiritually and putting women in positions of leadership for which they are not qualified and to which God did not appoint them. Furthermore, I do believe that witchcraft is the great national danger politically. As I, I'm a Britisher and I came to the United States and took United States citizenship. So I'm an American citizen by choice, which is more than most of you can say. <laughs> and I knew nothing of American history. As far as British are concerned, the pilgrims were dropouts. I mean, when they <laughs> made that mistake, that was the end. But I have become acquainted in the last few years with just a few of the background facts of, of American history. And I see this, two spiritual streams in this nation. One is a pure stream of the truth of God, such as no other nation outside of Israel has ever enjoyed. And the other is Satan's counterfeit, and essentially it's witchcraft. And the two are in opposition 
and the destiny of this nation is settled by how those two influences work out. You're probably, I mean all Americans I suppose are aware that every 20 years since 1860, the president elected in the 20th year has died in office, usually in rather tragic circumstances. The first such president was Abraham Lincoln, and I think a tremendous amount turns around what happened with him. Now, I'm a great admirer of Abraham Lincoln. I'm convinced he was a sincere, dedicated, committed Christian. I have a book which is called Shaping History Through Prayer and Fasting, and in that book I have three presidential proclamations made by Abraham Lincoln calling the entire nation to a day of humiliation, prayer, and fasting. The statements he makes in those proclamations are amazing. One of the things he says is this, that nation only is happy whose God is the Lord. This is officially recorded in the statutes of the United States. I can give you from my book the volume and the number of the proclamation. Few Americans know that. I've talked to many quite well-educated Americans, lawyers, doctors. They're not aware. Uh, in the history of this nation, four of your presidents proclaimed days of national humiliation, prayer, and fasting for the whole nation. And the language of those proclamations would do credit to most preachers. George Washington himself was a man who believed in prayer and fasting. And in his diaries, he records of a certain day, the 1st of June, what would it be, 1773, I think, went to church and spent the day fasting. But in the case of Abraham Lincoln, his wife, though I'm inclined to think she was a Christian, became deeply involved in spiritism and persuaded her husband to allow her to conduct a spiritist seance in the White House, which Lincoln attended, though he did not participate in. Now, I am personally convinced that that has a tremendous amount to do with the subsequent events of American history. I believe a curse was imported into the White House and came down over the presidency, and it is still being worked out. And it will probably take tremendous prayer by believing Christians to revoke that curse. 